Good morning. I want to start with a question that's going to kind of be the pervading question uh, really for, for our whole time uh, today. And the question is, what is it that you value most? <clears throat> and before you answer too quickly, before you think about it, I do want you to get some things in your mind. Maybe that's one thing. Maybe there's a few things. When I ask the question, what do you value most? But this should be a somewhat easier. Maybe we feel like it's a pretty easy uh, question to answer. But before we jump to a conclusion, as you're beginning to wrestle with and formulate in your mind what it is that you value most, I, I just I want us to pause and give us a moment. What is it that is most important to you? What is it that has the uh, greatest worth within your life? What is it that you value most? And as you're getting some of those things or thing within your, within your mind, I have a second question uh, as, you've, as you've got it kind of sitting there. And that is, how do you know that you value that thing or those things the most? Uh, like, do you, do you value something the most simply because you say so? Uh, just because you, you would say, this is what's most important to me, does that automatically actually make it what's most valuable to you? If you wrote down what you, you felt like was most valuable to you and then you signed it on a legal document, does that automatically make it what's most valuable to you? Or, or maybe, what if somebody observes your life and they, and they say, well, here's what it looks like is most valuable to you, does that automatically make it what's actually most valuable to you? I'm not sure that either one of those first two things completely are are true statements, that if we just say that something is valuable to us, I'm not sure that that really determines whether it actually is valuable to you. And I'm not sure if someone observes your life and it looks like something is valuable, I'm not sure that that by itself, though it may be better than the first, I'm not sure that that by itself means that something actually is of great value to you. Right, I think maybe a better way for us to track what is most valuable to us is by looking back on our previous days, look back in your past five days, in the past week, in the past two weeks, three weeks, and go down the trail of your life, of what you just lived, and ask ourselves the question of where did I invest the most attention, the most energy, the most money, the most loyalty to And though we may say with our mouth that something is valuable to us, what really shows where we place our value is the way that we spend our time, money, energy, attention, loyalty. You can follow the trail of your life. Look at your checkbook. What does your checkbook say is most valuable to you? If you were, if you were, uh, or somebody was following you around unbeknownst to you and they were just recording down in a diary what you did every single moment, And then you were to go back and flip through those pages and you're to ask yourself, what is most valuable to me? What would it really reveal? What is it that you talk about most? What do you sacrifice the most for? Or how about this last question? What is it that you celebrate the most? Now I want to pause and explain that one for just a second is because I, I, I remember being in youth ministry and, and talking with frustrated parents. And by the way, I'm, I'm entering this phase, and so like I know this is a, a struggle as a parent. Like I, I'm not like trying to be critical here, but I'm, I'm asking the question because I know how, much, uh, how valuable it is for us to evaluate with this question of what you celebrate. Is I, I would hear parents and I'd hear grandparents, even within my own family, that were frustrated when their kids or their grandkids weren't they weren't living godly lives like they desired. They weren't, they weren't honoring Jesus with their life. But then simultaneously, if you looked at their li- those, those parents and those grandparents, you looked at their lives day in, day out, and you asked the question, what is it that they celebrated in their kids' lives? How little, how little the celebrations had to do with anything spiritual. Rather, almost all the celebrations had to do with academics, academics, 
had to do with um, athletics, had to do with pure behavior. See, when we really look at what we celebrate, then we're really showing what it is that's most valuable to us. So what is it that's most valuable to you? And what I want to do as we start is I, I actually just want to pray for us, and I, and I want to include myself. I had a discussion after the first service. I want to include myself in this as well because this is something that, that I struggle day in and day out with just like any of the rest of us. This is, a, this is a struggle that we're in together. But I want to start by just asking God to search our heart over these next uh, few minutes and just to ask ourselves, have God show us What is it, if we trace through our life, that we really value the most? Let's go to God in prayer and just ask Him. God, I just pray that right now that you would work through, starting with me and then uh, just to all the rest of us, that you would just begin to search our hearts. That you would give us clear lenses to see the way that we have lived this past week. That we would see clear lenses to see the way that we lived this past month, this past year, the past couple years. And you would show us what it is that we really value. That you would show us the way that we're really living and as a result what it is that is on the pedestal of our lives. Because God, we know, as we're going to talk about today, that what we value most correlates directly with what and how we worship. God, work in us and through us during this time. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> Last week we began a series titled The Daniel Dilemma. And uh, we framed up the series by looking at the narrative arc. Now I'm not going to um, I'm not going to tell the story of Little Red Riding Hood and talk about how grandma gets cut open. Um, by the way, it's definitely the wolf that gets cut open. Sorry about that fumble. Anyway, um, <clears throat> We, we, we've talked about th- this narrative arc and starting with, with Daniel, that we've been looking at the book of Daniel and we're going through a character study and we're asking the question, how do we stand firm and love well in a culture of compromise, in a culture that, that doesn't honor God, that isn't a theocracy, that has God as king, if you will, but has different values and values drive culture. So we can all acknowledge that the culture that we live in its values do not align with God's values. There may have been a season where some values did align, but increasingly so, we're living in a culture that values are contrary to God's values, and values drive a culture. So when we look at the book of of Daniel, we get an example Uh, We get opportunities to look at at some character studies as to how we as God's people can live in a culture of compromise. And the setting of of Daniel, as we saw within Habakkuk, with the narrative, the setting is is God's people in in God's land, and yet sin has, has pervaded the camp. It has raided the camp so much so that if you remember in Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk is crying out and he's saying, God, where are you? Are you seeing all of this injustice? Everybody's doing what's right within their own eyes. Do you see all this wickedness? And this is the setting with God's people in, in, in God's, God's land. But then the event comes that God said was going to happen, and the event or the problem is, uh, is the Babylonians come in and they lay siege Actually, I'm going to use this other one here. They lay siege to the land. That is, they, they kind of cut everything off. They take charge. They invade, they invade the land. And then those tensions and the, the problems just keep on escalating to the point where you get to the climax, and that is the people are officially living in exile, that some of the Babylonians have taken off it basically removed the people completely from their land, particularly the higher class people, where God's people, Daniel and his buddies, as we're going to see in a second, they're living in exile. They're God's people living in a completely different culture in a completely different land. Now, here's what's great about the book of Daniel, is that we've got the author, who, uh, um, who is probably Daniel, 
Well, we've, we've, we've got the, the author here that records later on, or the Bible tells us later on, that there is an outcome, and the outcome is that they get reestablished. <clears throat> they get reestablished. And, uh, it, but what, what's great about the book of Daniel is that during this period is the book of Daniel. It's, it's the period between the exile or during the exile and to the point where they get reestablished again in their land, where they're back to, to their own place, where they're no longer living in exile. And what we have during those 70 years, what we have during these 70 years is how it is that Daniel and his buddies lived in, in a culture of compromise, and yet they stood firm in their faith and they loved well while they while they did it. Now, we can now look at the book of Daniel, and we can begin to ask the questions, well, how do we do what they did? What example did they give us? How was it that they lived as God's people in, a, in exile? Because we, as God's people, as the church, have been living in exile, if you will, for 2,000 years. And then the story just looks a little bit different, where our story it starts with creation. If I can spell creation... Our story starts with creation, and the event is the fall. That is, when sin entered into the world, and since sin has entered into the world, that sin has just continually snowballed. It started with, started with murder, and it just kind of continued into violence, into war. And, and, it, and we can look at the world now that we live in, and though God said in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, he made all things, he said it was good, he said it was good, he said it was good, he looked at everything and said it's very good. Now we look at the world and say... I don't think so. This world doesn't look very good anymore, and the reason is sin. Well, we know that God had a plan, that God was going to take care of that sin, that God was going to redeem, he was going to fix everything that was wrong, and what he was going to do to fix everything that was wrong is he was going to send his son Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that he sent Jesus into the world. God in the flesh, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and he lived a sinless life. And he laid his life down as a ransom for many. He came to seek and to save the lost. He laid his life down as a ransom for us. He paid the price of sin. And then ultimately, he didn't just pay the price uh, of sin, but he, he defeated death by resurrecting to new life. Ultimately, he sins back into heaven after commissioning his church. He gathers his church and he says, I want you to go and make disciples. My people, the church, I want you to go out and I want you to go and be the light of the world. I want you to go to be the salt of the earth. In other words, go out and influence culture. Go out into the world and make disciples. Go make other people that are not of this world anymore. And our period is not 70 years because what Jesus promised was that he was going to come again that he was going to return, and when he returned, he was going to make everything right. It was going to be the consummation. Everything that he talked about, the whole plan was going to come to its apex, and he's going to wipe away every tear from every eye. He's going to make all things new. Everything is going to be how God intended it. The problem is we are living in this period of exile between the second coming of Christ and the end times. Here's some for free information. Anytime the New Testament talks about the end times, this is what he's talking about. The end times is the time from Jesus' ascension to the time of Jesus' second coming. You can talk about that with me later. Cal and I like to talk about that stuff, so we'll talk about it later. So we're in, the, we're in these days here, in the period of exile, that we're foreigners and strangers in this world. So this is the same story that we're seeing in the book of Daniel. It's the same story that we're living as well. Now, we saw last week that culture will present some challenges to God's people. The first challenge we saw last, uh, last week is that culture will try to confuse our identities. Culture already has confused the identities of many people. It's convinced them that they can choose what's right for themselves. It's convinced them that they can choose to live their own, their own truth. But the reality is, is that, that God has created us all in his image. That we are his people. We are his creation. And that we have an identity in Christ once we choose to follow him. And yet, the culture has a way of confusing our identities and, and making us forget who it is that we are. Culture's greatest impact that he can have on us is to confuse us of our identity, to make us forget who we are. As God's people, created in his image, 
made new, a new creation. And then this week, this week we're talking about a test that culture presents us with, not just one time, but on a daily basis. Culture presents us with a great test, and that's the question of whom will we worship? Whom will we worship? And one, one, of, the, one of my favorite Bible stories, and it's one that we're all going to know, it's in Daniel chapter 3. It, it's, this, it's a story of three, it, it, it's Daniel's friends. We're actually not going to see Daniel uh, in this text, but we're going to see his buddies that were introduced to in the first chapter of, of Daniel. See, here's the thing about, I want to say about this text before we begin to read it. This is one of our favorite children's church stories. It's one of our favorite stories that we, um, we kind of grow up in the faith, learning. We love to hear it. I loved reading it again. I'm going to enjoy reading it here again and here in a second. But the reality is we kind of we cutesify this text. We, we kind of fluff it up a little bit, like just it's a really good story. But the reality is there are some great ramifications, and there is a great message for us right in the middle of it. So let's start with uh, with Daniel chapter 3, with the first seven verses. Here's the setting of the story, if you will. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, official governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the pr- provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue, uh, the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shout, shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow down to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So King Nebuchadnezzar is a really like paranoid, self-conscious, and arrogant, arrogant man. And we're going to see that throughout this, that he's just, he's just self-conscious. He's, he's always feeling threatened. And apparently to prove, uh, his, in his mind, his sovereignty, to show his power, he, he creates this 90-foot image, this 90-foot statue. It's just, I, I was trying to wrestle with how big 90 feet was. and um, So I asked Todd, I said, how, how tall is, is like the, the children's tower there? And he said, I'm not sure about that. But he said, the peak of the Family Life Center is 30 feet tall. So take the highest point of our Family Life Center and multiply it by three times. 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. This is a huge image that we're talking about here. And it says it was made of gold, which means it was just probably plated with gold. It probably wasn't solid gold. It wouldn't have lasted very long, but just plated with gold. And we don't know exactly what this image was, was of. Uh, we, we don't know if it was of an image of King Nebuchadnezzar himself. We don't know if it was um, something to do with the Babylonian Gods, we don't, we don't really know what the image was. But what we can be certain about is that this image was for the purpose of, of showing King Nebuchadnezzar's sovereignty. This was to show him that he's powerful, that every time that he saw people bow down to this, it was as if they were bowing to him, because this was his command, this was his edict. So every time it would be a little stroke of his ego when that music would play and the people would bow down. And as the, as the um, story writes here, as we see this, we see this emphasis of the pressure that was placed there. First, there's the pressure of all of the leading officials. You've got these, these list of officials of the Babylonian uh, Empire that, that are there gathered around the statue. And as they are the leaders, they're creating this edict that they're applying this pressure on everybody else. See, watch all these leaders They're all bowing down. They're all doing this. They're the ones making the command. Everybody else follows suit because culture has a way of applying pressure of conformity. Culture has a way of applying pressure for conformity, and that's exactly what's taking place. You've got all these leaders. You've got all these uh, these high officials that are leading the charge to bow down to this, that when the music plays, they're they're all going to bow down. 
In fact, scholar Dean uh, Fool says this. He says, through repetition, the narrator creates a scenario in which conformity is normative, disobedience is unthinkable. As this is being written, it's being written in a way that is like nobody would dare disobey the king. Nobody would dare go against this because, see, look at the pressure of all the leaders. Look at the pressure of all the people to get them to bow down. And then secondarily, there's a punishment if they don't. They're going to be thrown in to the fiery furnace. We must take note that this was a culture. And all cultures have a way of applying pressure for conformity. So there's the setting, continuing into, into verse, verse 8. But some of the astrologers, that is some of those officials, went to the king and informed on the Jews. In other words, they told on the Jews. They said to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. In other words, you issued a decree requiring all people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states, remind you, Mr. King, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown in the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have uh, put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. See, it seems that when, when the music plays and everybody bows down, that there's just thousands, there's multitudes that are bound down and worship before this idol, that all the king can see is the multitudes, and he apparently misses that there's at least, we don't know really how many, but we know there was at least three guys that refused. There's three guys that remained standing. But these other comrades, these colleagues, if you will, of these three guys are jealous. Well, why are they jealous? Well, let's just go back to chapter 1 again and remember that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that um, these four guys were, were given ten times the wisdom, that they were brighter, they were cut above the rest. Therefore, they continually worked their way up, up the ladder, certainly making uh, the other Babylonians and the other leaders jealous. So this accusation comes as nothing else than to downplay the Jews because they, even the way they phrase it, these certain Jews, it's kind of like a, a kind of an anti-Semitic idea here that they're kind of a second-class citizens whom, he says, you've put in charge of, of, of some, some things. You've put them in charge of, of uh, territories. Like, these are the guys that we're talking about here. And then they make the accusations. They say, uh, they're, they're disrespecting you. They're not listening to what you, what you have to say. They're not paying any attention to you. And second, they say, they refuse to worship your gods, King Nebuchadnezzar. And third, then they, then they come to the crackdown. They come to the big accusation of, and they're refusing to bow down to the statue that you say we all have to, you have to bow down to. These guys don't have any good intentions. They just simply are jealous professionally. And so they tattle on these three, three guys. And it's important to note that Apparently, they were quietly abstaining. They weren't making some big stink. They weren't creating a big show. They were simply, what was doing, they were simply doing what was right. They weren't conforming to the pattern. They were still living quietly and graciously and choosing to do the right thing. So as these guys tattle, here is Nebuchadnezzar's response. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down to the, and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace and then what, catch this, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? There's the king's arrogance. So first he does a little fact checking. He says, hey, hey Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is this true? Is these, are these accusations actually true? Is what I'm hearing accurate that you refuse to worship my gods, and that you refuse to bow down, that you are disobeying me? And then he gives them an opportunity to comply. He gives them a second chance. He goes, well, that music's going to play again. And you have the opportunity 
to bow down to it. And then third, he warns them straight from the king's lips this time, not from, not from a messenger, but straight from the king's lips, looking them right in the eye, and he says, and if you don't, I am going to throw you into the furnace. And then he mocks God and says, and then what God's going to rescue you from my hand? Well, Nebuchadnezzar is going to get a nice little uh, lesson here to, as to how sovereign he really is. But before we get to their response in these next few verses, I, I, let, let's note that this is like the opportunity for them to downplay what they've just did. This is the opportunity for them to like justify their actions. This is the opportunity for them uh, to try to like talk, talk themselves out of it. Like this was the opportunity. They could have just left here and just waited for the next opportunity and disobeyed again and then see what the king was going to do at that point. Rather, they don't bother waiting for the music to play again. They don't bother waiting for another opportunity to disobey. They just respond. Listen to their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown in the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from, from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Talk about a statement. They just responded straight up with truth. They responded with boldness. And I'll, I'll, again, I want us to take note, they also responded courteously. Twice. Your majesty. They weren't jerks. They weren't angry. They weren't red in the face. They simply responded boldly and truthfully. They refused to apologize for what they have done. They said, I don't need a defense. They made it clear that their reverence, their reverence for God was so high that they, did, they had no fear of man. Second, they were confident in God's power. They knew that God had the power to deliver and that he was going to do so one way or another. That in some way, in some form, God was going to deliver them. They were absolutely confident of that and they told the king as much. And then they said, but even if God doesn't deliver us from this immediate situation, we still refuse to bow down. They were willing to be charcoal, turned to ash before bowing down. That the, the, the pressure of the culture, the pressure of the power of the king, the pressure of death was not going to get them to bow down to the ways of the culture. Deliverance or death, they refused to conform to the idolatrous ways of the culture. They knew who they were. They had resolved ahead of time. They knew their identity, and they refused to bow down to any false god because they knew that any god other than Yahweh God was no god at all. They weren't going there. Deliverance or death, they refused to conform to the idolatrous ways of the culture. Then we step into the climax of the story. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. That's a pretty sight. He, did, he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them in the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because, the, and because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. And then is the climax. Now it's that moment. What's going to happen next? Now what? How are they going to get out of this? But suddenly, but suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaims to his advisors, I wish I could have heard this next part. I wish I could have heard how we said it. Didn't we throw three guys in there? Like, like weren't there three guys that we tied up and threw into the furnace? And all those leaders that we just mentioned that were kind of gathered around, uh, they said, uh, uh, well, yes, your majesty, uh, <laughs> there was just three and Nebuchadnezzar gets the crowd, he gets all of those other officials around him. You know, remember, this was intended to be a statement of, see, here's what happens if you don't listen to me. And now he has all those officials around him. He's, he's shown them a lesson, he's thrown them into the furnace. And now with those very same officials where he's showing what the punishment for disobedience is, now he's saying, look, I see four men. 
unbound, walking around the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god, or the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, here it is, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, there they are again, governors and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. You ever sat around a campfire? It's a miracle by itself that they didn't smell like smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defiled the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. <laughs> whether, uh, whether this worship of the king is legitimate or not, it's just evidence that... Uh, he had some more growing to do. <laughs> if you speak a word against them, we're going to shred you to pieces. Uh, not exactly God's idea of evangelizing, by the way. <laughs> but, this incident shows a clear message that the true power for deliverance is in the hands of God alone, this very king who was set out to show that he was the one that was all-powerful, he learns a lesson and he gets to see the true power of God to deliver. Now, I just want to pause just here for just a second and, and for us to recognize, sometimes we read this story and, and all we can see is, is the deliverance side and, and we, we can accidentally take it as a promise of deliverance, that God's going to so any furnace that we go through, God's going to deliver you from it. Any flames or any valley difficulty, God's going to spare you from it. Wait a minute, pause. They were thrown into the furnace. They weren't spared anything. They were still thrown into the furnace. But God doesn't promise that we're not going to have difficulty. In fact, Jesus told us just the opposite, that we are going to have challenges. We are going to have difficulty but regardless of whether we're delivered in an immediate situation or not, we know there's a fourth man. We know there's a fourth figure. We know there's a fourth person standing. There's a debate as to who this fourth figure is. There's kind of the Jewish standpoint that says, well, it was, a, it was an angel. It was a messenger of God. Regardless, that... That, that's God's presence there with them in the midst of the blaze. There's also another camp that says this is, this is what's called a Christophany, which is this is a pre-incarnate Jesus. That this is Jesus that's there walking with them in the fire, and what a great picture that is, and I think the case for that one is rather strong, but here's the point. It doesn't really matter which one because the truth is that when we're in a fire, when we're in a difficulty, that God is with there walking with us. And that whether he delivers us now or delivers us later, the God we serve has the power over all kingdoms of this world. We know that God has the power and offers the promise of deliverance, if not in this life, then in the next. And when we stand, it doesn't just impact us but to all who watch us as we stand firm, even in the midst of trial. You catch that at the end of the story. Nebuchadnezzar who says, they disobeyed me. And they disobeyed me because they worshiped first and foremost their God. And their God has delivered them. See, the same thing still happens today. We can read story after story after story of, of missionaries who have been killed for, for their faith. They've been killed for being for being a missionary, and that, 
the officials that are standing around, that are perhaps doing the executing or that are just witnessing this whole thing, actually come to faith. They see the one true God who delivers because they're watching those who stand firm right in front of them. See, we can impact culture when we stand firm, even in the face of pressure, even in the face of trial. But what does this really look like for us in terms of application? I mean, it can be tempting, to, again, to sugarcoat this just a little bit and for us to say, well, wait a minute, we, we, don't, live in the, we don't live in the ancient Near East. You know, there's not, last I checked, there wasn't uh, altars and, and, and uh, giant monuments being forced for us to bow down to. I don't hear any music being played forcing us. I mean, we live in the U.S. of A, baby. Like, this isn't the world. We don't live in that world. Which I would say, you're, you're right, that the form of worship and idolatry does indeed look a little bit different, and I would argue that the impact is just the same, and the temptations are all the more subtle and just as challenging. And this goes back to the question that we started with, what do you value most? And that matters because what we value most has a direct correlation to what we truly worship. What we value most has direct correlation with what we truly worship. It may not be a gold statue like thousands of years ago, but idolatry is the same as struggle Nonetheless, and it's just far more subtle and I would argue just as, if not more, threatening than it was then. German theologian uh, uh, P. Tillich has pointed out that a person's God is the thing or person that one is most concerned about, thinks the most about, or affects one's life the most. You catch that? A person's God is the thing or person that one is most concerned about, thinks the most about, or affects one's life the most. In other words, a person's God is what someone values the most. Chris Hodges uh, says this, he says, the truth is we all worship something. Whether we're deliberate about it or not, we all bow down to something. Every day, all day long, and everywhere we go, we worship. It's what we do. It's who we are. Worship is our response to what we most value. Worship is our response to what we most value. Church reformer uh, John Calvin uh, was a bit more crass, and I really didn't like this one when he said the human mind is a factory of idols. The human mind is a factory of idols. We have constant temptation, a constant temptation on a daily basis to put someone in the spot of God. We have a constant temptation every single day to put something in the place of God in our lives. So here's the reality. Satan doesn't come wearing a red jumpsuit and horns and jumping up and down saying, here am I. Satan comes in the form of things that we think we desire. The culture has a pressure. And it's a pressure to conform. Let's just talk about a, a, a few of those. Is there's a few categories that that it does not take us very long, and we, I don't even really have to hardly explain any of these. I just have to put them up here for us to recognize that culture has a pressure to conform, and these are idols that we worship at the altar of frequently. One of them, let's see, where do we want to start? Let's just start with the obvious one. Money, possessions, stuff that we own. We've got to have the bigger house. We've got to have the fancier car. We've got to have the new computer. We've got to have the new gadget. And day in, day out, day in, day out, if we really reflect on the way that we live, we've got idols such as this that are fighting for the throne of our hearts. 
or, or really tied in with that is, ooh, that was not good, is power or dynamite. Is that what we want is we want to work up our, I mean, and, and Think about this. This is what our culture celebrates. This is what our culture sells. What does it mean to be successful? Well, it's to be at the top of your company ladder. It's to be the top of a company. I mean, we celebrate it all the time. Oh, he's such, a, such a, an influential individual, individual. He is the CEO of. And what do we celebrate? We, we, we celebrate even as, as a church. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But we do, we, we celebrate that, hey, they got a promotion, they worked their way up the ladder. And if we really look day in, day out, day in, day out, these are the things that can drive us. Or, or how about, uh, there's, there's also this one here. I don't know why I drew like that. You've got people. You have relationships. Sometimes you've got another, a significant other, that they're actually your idol. And did you know that actually an idol can be a good thing? Like family? That your family, I'm admitting this struggle here, your family can actually become an idol. Good thing, but you can actually put your family on the throne of your life before God. What would happen if you reversed that though? If you worshiped at the altar of God, and then you're going to have, you're going to lead your family you're going to love your family, and you're going to trust God with the family like you're intended. We can worship at the altar of family. Or the fun one, and my apologies for um, this bad drawing here. I'm not an artist. I asked my wife, well, how do you represent this one? And, and I think she, had, hey, this is much better than last time. Ice cream cone or cotton candy, doesn't really matter. <laughs> Representing Pleasure. We can laugh for a second, but as soon as I say the word pleasure, all of us know that there is a deep seed within so many of us that's pervading that our culture's selling for pleasure, sexual pleasure. Pleasure for a new fix, pleasure for a new high, pleasure for, uh, for a, another, another drug or for addiction. I mean, just think about how the culture sells this. Walk through the checkout line at Walmart or at Meijer and just look at the magazine racks. What are they selling you? They're selling you pleasure. See, these are the things that culture celebrates, and what's scary is so often they creep into the church. And these actually become the idols in which we unintentionally worship. This is our daily struggle. The greatest test of our culture is whom will you worship? Is it at the altar of a God who saves, a God who delivers, a God who made you and designed you and created you? Or are we really, if we look, if we go through the diary of our lives, if we've recorded every single minute, if we look at how we've spent our time, our money, our energy, if we looked at where we put our attention, if we've looked where we placed our cravings, if we look when we wake up in the morning, the time that we go to bed, what is it that you really value? How much of our time, attention, energy, money, is invested into the king, the one true king. Chris Hodges, the Christian life can be distilled down to our daily struggle over what and how to worship. And that's basically just a restatement of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. When Jesus looked at the crowd and says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This is a daily decision. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, whoever finds their life will lose it. So in other words, people that are trying to find their own life, they're trying to find their own truth, they're trying to make their own way, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And if you've ever ran down this track, or if you're running down this track right now, you know quite well that it ends in vain. 
you know quite well that it just leaves you empty. It just leaves you wanting. That if you, if you attain maybe one of these goals, that you just want something else. You just want more. You just want one more step. That if we are worshiping at these altars, it's going to leave us a mess. It's going to leave us broken. It's just going to leave us wanting some more. But when we bow down and worship, when everybody else stands, and when we stand when everybody else bows to culture because we are at the altar of the one true God, he will never leave us wanting. He will never leave us feeling empty. Rather, it's in those moments that he gives us life and life abundantly. One more thing, and then I'm done. <clears throat> How is it that we do this? How is it that we have the courage to stand when culture bows and to bow when culture stands? Where do we get that courage? Where do we get that ability? And this may sound like a cliche. It may sound like a simple answer. Regardless, it's the right truth. The way we get the ability, the way we get that courage to stand where everybody else bows and bows and everybody else stands is by spending time with Jesus daily. Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Peter and John are on trial. Here's what's recorded. When they, those who had him on trial, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. When we follow the trail of our lives, the greatest evidence that our worship of God is our highest value is how much time we spend with Jesus. Because you can't spend time with Jesus and stay the same. You can't spend time with Jesus and stay the same. Culture's greatest test in our lives is who do we worship? So in just a second, we're going to, the songs are going to play. The music is going to sound. This time, the worship is intended for the one true God. But may you take this song as a moment to align the question we asked at the beginning, to align it with what we ask at the end. The first question being, what is it that you value most? The second question being, who is it that you worship? And let the songs of your lips, the songs of your mouth, be representative of the God in who you serve. Allow God to search your heart and really ask yourself, who is it that you really worship day in and day out? Father God, we just thank you for the way that you work in our lives. God, I just pray that right now you would search our hearts, that you would show us. God, sometimes this discussion, we can't, uh, we can't see it ourselves. Sometimes we need the help of somebody else, and, and we always need your help, God, to show us where it is that we have wayward ways within us, where we have idolatry. But God, I just pray that you would help us take a bold step that, to step away from these things, the ways that culture tries to cram us into a mold and, and to cause us to worship these false gods. And God, may we come to, to your throne. And may we put you on the throne of our lives, that we would fill the God-shaped hole in our heart to worship you above all else, and that you would give us life and life abundantly. God, help us to make those steps. Help us to use just even this next song as a time to, to proclaim that, that truth, to declare our worship is to you, to allow you to search our hearts, and for us to repent of where we have wayward ways. God, you are good, and it's in this moment that we place our trust in you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.